Folks, we're now going to have our final two speakers and then have a Q&A session. So uh, I'd like to call to the stage a man that's very well known, respected in these parts, Belfast. It's Mr. Danny Morrison. Thank you very much. I usually like to speak without notes, but I decided that uh, I wanted to go on a tirade and make sure that my uh, facts were correct, my dates were correct, so that's why I'm reading from a speech. So bear with me. Most of us know that Britain invented the concentration camp, which it first used against poor families in South Africa, in which camps 28,000 children, women and men perished. Speak earlier referred to the Amritsar massacre in India in 1919, when British soldiers under the command of General Dyer shot dead 380 unarmed people protesting against conscription. You probably also know that the first use of poison gas and aerial bombing against civilians was authorised by Winston Churchill in Iraq, also in 1919. But few of you will have heard of Deng Xiaoping, and I choose to open with Deng Xiaoping because it represents one of those small cruelties which typifies the mindset of a racist British establishment and the ways in which the forces of British imperialism have travelled the world, massacring and torturing people at their leisure. In 1882, Britain occupied Egypt. Deng Xiaoping was a small village in the Nile Delta where the locals supplemented their meagre incomes through pigeon farming. On June the 13th, 1906, five British army officers thought that they would have some sport in the village. They arrived and began shooting the pigeons. The villagers were furious and remonstrated with them. One of the officers opened fire, wounding five people, including a woman whose husband hit the soldier with a stick. The shots also set the grain store on fire. The soldiers were surrounded, but two escaped and ran off to raise the alert. One of these soldiers collapsed from sunstroke and head wounds. When British reinforcements arrived, they beat to death an Egyptian peasant who had brought water to the dying soldier. The soldiers in Deng Xiaoping were released. Their injuries amounted in total to one broken wrist. The British Army arrested 52 villagers and held a show trial. Of the five judges, only two knew Arabic and only one was a Muslim. Death sentences were passed and the accused weren't allowed to appeal. They hanged four men, sentenced another two to penal servitude for life, and 26 others were given various terms of hard labour and ordered to be flogged. An Egyptian policeman a whistleblower who said the soldiers started the trouble and opened fire twice on the people, was stood down, charged, and was sentenced to two years' imprisonment and 50 lashes for contradicting the official account. George Bernard Shaw, writing about the incident, said, they had room for only one man on the gallows and had to leave him hanging half an hour to make sure that he was dead and give his family plenty of time to watch him swinging. Thus having two hours to kill, as well as four men, they kept the entertainment going by flogging eight men with 50 lashes. The incident was raised during question time in the House of Commons. Anyone who queried the soldiers and the administration was accused by a government minister of being unpatriotic and giving succour to the agitators. A minister told the Commons that all possible humanity was shown in carrying out the executions that the arrangements were admirable and reflect great credit on all concerned and that due dignity was observed. One week ago, a century later, another British minister in the House of Commons, Karen Bradley, said of British soldiers involved in killing Irish citizens that they were people acting under orders and under instruction and fulfilling their duty in a dignified and appropriate way. Deng Xiaoping, due dignity was observed. Dari, fulfilling their duty in a dignified and appropriate way. This is the imperialist state at its most open. But the imperialist state 
is such a glutton, has such greed, that official state killings, for which they will expediently apologise under certain conditions, are still not enough. The special powers are not enough. The Emergency Provisions Act is not enough. The Prevention of Terrorism, the Public Order Act, the curfew, internment, torture and interrogation centres, plastic bullets, show trials are not enough. And so it must be supplemented by repression, by means of the dirty war and the propaganda war. The key exponent of the dirty war in this era was Brigadier Frank Kitson, who served in the North and who published a book in 1971, Low Intensity Operations, in which he said, the government must promote its own cause and undermine that of the enemy by disseminating its view of the situation. And this involves a carefully planned and coordinated campaign of what, for want of a better word, must regrettably be called psychological operations. In order to put an insurgency campaign down, it is sometimes necessary to do unpleasant things. So what were these unpleasant things? Undercover soldiers in plain clothes, MRF, Military Reaction Force, driving around nationalist areas, opening fire on civilians. The author, Martin Dillon, described the MRF's purpose as being to draw the provisional IRA into a shooting war with loyalists in order to distract the IRA from its objective of attacking the British Army. Then there was the Glenan Gang, made up of UVF paramilitaries, RUC officers and UDR soldiers believed to have killed at least 120 people in County Tyrone and County Armagh. A variety of British intelligence agencies, including the RUC Special Branch, also ran double agents in both Loyalist paramilitaries and the IRA. Brian Nelson, a former British soldier, was recruited and sent into the Loyalist UDA to coordinate its intelligence and organise attacks on Irish Republicans, including elected representatives of Sinn Féin. He was run by the Force Research Unit, FRU, another Kitson derivative or franchise. British intelligence helped arm the Loyalists in a three-way deal, and we do hear this, involving Israel, which had seized PLO weapons in Beirut when it invaded Lebanon in 1982, apartheid South Africa, which needed blue pipe and javelin missile technology stolen from shorts in East Belfast to bring down MiG fighters in its war against the MPLA in Angola. Arms and grenades from this shipment were used by Michael Stone to kill three people in the Milltown Massacre attack in March 1988, uh, killed three people including my best friend Kevin Brady. Hundreds of other people were assassinated in the early 1990s by loyalists using these weapons. When Nelson was exposed and charged, a deal was done involving the Lord Chief Justice and the British Attorney General to ensure that he received a reduced sentence. The British officer who gave him a character reference was Brigadier Gordon Kerr, head of FRU, later promoted to British military attaché in Beijing to keep him sweet, I would argue. And I'm sure most people here know that I of no love for informers. <laughs> but objectively, you would imagine that there would be some sort of duty of care by a government towards people whom it had recruited as informers. In the case of State Knife, a British agent inside the IRA, he was responsible for the abduction, interrogation and culling of informers who had lived their usefulness to the British state. All of this was done with the knowledge of his handlers, whose mandate came from Number 10 Downing Street. British intelligence hoped that State Knife's role would raise his prestige and status inside the IRA, but its objective was also to demoralise the nationalist community and alienate a section of that community, the informer's immediate family, relations and friends from the Republican struggle. And of course, media propagandists and anti-Republican journalists would then ruin behind the killing of informers to exaggerate the degree of penetration. There is another question. How far did the state go in protecting agents it considered still valuable? 
I have no, no doubt that there must have been occasions when the lives of British soldiers were sacrificed in order to protect an informer inside the IRA. Former IUC Detective Sergeant John T. Brown investigated the murder of Pat Finucane, questioned the loyalist Ken Barrett, who admitted the killing and who said that he had been encouraged to kill Pat Finucane by the IUC. John T. Brown said that he was thwarted from bringing arrests or charges. We weren't allowed to. Every obstruction they, every obstruction they the special branch could think of, they moved heaven and earth to stop that. He said that a high-level decision was taken to block the murder investigation and that Special Branch destroyed a tape which recorded, recorded Barrett's confession of killing Pat Finucane. And of course, all this was done under the name of National Security and the Official Secrets Act. For whistleblowing, John D. Brown was hounded out of the RUC and harassed. He said, I was shunned and one special branch man made a sinister threat to have guns planted in my home. He was also told that his life was in danger from his colleagues. He said, I am not fearing the UVF, UDA, IRA or INLA. I am fearing state-inspired people who would, if it suited them, use them to kill me. We've yet to fully fathom the role of British intelligence agencies in stoking and directing this, this conflict, or setting one side against the other. Sir John Stevens was tasked with carrying out an inquiry into allegations of state collusion with loyalist paramilitaries. He may have thought he was coming over here for a couple of months, but he actually spent 15 years coming back to uh, engage in the study of the collusion. We were told that his report would be made public, but he was only allowed to publish 17 pages out of a 3,000 page report. As the truth slowly emerges, historians and academics will have to examine anew the statistics of the conflict. It will certainly be the case that Karen Bradley's figure that the British state was only responsible for 10% of the killings will be adjusted dramatically upwards. I also have no doubt that the calls for a 10 year statute of limitations regarding charges against British soldiers, which would lead to a general amnesty, has more to do with the fear that the British establishment has that some of its former agents, including senior military figures, endangered by the truth and or prosecution, will threaten to expose that the orders came from number 10 Downing Street. I presume many of you heard the New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinta Ardern, imploring people to remember the names of those killed in the mosques and not the name of their killer. Back in 1906, while the names of the killers of Deng Shawai were mentioned and lauded in the House of Commons, those Egyptian villagers who were flogged and hanged were not. And so, let's even now remember those, the wretched of the earth, the victims of imperialism and its hubris, Hassan Ali Mahfouz, Yusuf Hussein Salem, El Sayed Issa Salam, and Mohammed Darwish Zaran. Gorobogov. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, can we have our final speaker?